So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have three commitments that we make to everyone who's in attendance today for the 12-hour marathon. Number one is you in the audience, you show up, you get value, and you take a step in the right direction to become your greatest possible self. Number two, each of the special guests who comes on, they make a meaningful difference in at least one person's life. Most likely many, many more, but it all starts with one step at a time. And number three is that I make a meaningful difference in at least one person's life. Most likely many more, but it all starts with one step at a time. I'm 100% sure I've already done one today, so I'm giving myself a round of applause. <laughs> and a pat on the back. Great job, Chris. Keep up the great work. I promise we will 100%. And me and Quinn are about to bring some freaking heat to your face. Before that, though, I want to share about the 21-day challenge because this interview is brought to you by Burn Up Coaching and the 21-day challenge. So if you're an entrepreneur or a high achiever, you're feeling stuck overwhelmed, you plateaued, spinning the wheels, you just feel like you're not getting what you want out of life, you're not going where you want to go, you're not reaching the peak of your mountain that you know you're capable of reaching, the 21-day challenge might be the ignition for you to be able to create momentum and build the life of your dreams. So that's the 21-day challenge. It's daily one-on-one accountability and support, weekly deep dive calls to make sure that you are dialing in your success beliefs and letting go of all the trash and the junk and limiting beliefs that don't serve you. You're going to dial in your habits, dial in your routines, get clear on your top priorities and goal in your dreams of your life, your your purpose. You're going to get clear on your purpose even more so than you were before and more tied into that. So that's the 21 day challenge. It's a lot of fun. Definitely. It's not for everyone, but as Rich Brocchini said in the last interview make it for you if you want it to work you make it work (laughs) but it is not for everyone because not everyone wants to step up to that level but i know that you if you're listening have that potential within you so i invite you to send me a message and let me know you're interested and we'll see if you are a good fit for sure for the long run for the overall best possible self of you so that's the 21 day challenge looking forward to hearing from you about it now, let's talk about the iTunes review of the week, and it's left by Mr. Rico Caveglia. And Rico says, I love Chris's title and subject. One of the biggest challenges we have as human- humanity is lack of expectation of what's possible. All of his podcasts are exactly about how to become your best possible self because that's, where, that's why you are here and because you can. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rico. Appreciate you, man. And if you want to give us a review, go to beergps.com forward slash iTunes, and you can find Becoming Your Greatest Possible Self on iTunes, so we appreciate that, and uh, you can also search Becoming Your Greatest Possible Self, and and you'll be able to give us a review, so thanks in advance for doing that for us. Now, for the man of the hour, not many words, but this man is a powerful, powerful dude, Quinn Amorim. Quinn is the host of two podcasts, an e-commerce expert that has been selling online for 21 years. He has created several brands through the process of private labeling and has worldwide distribution with Amazon. Oh my goodness. We are in for an absolute treat. Quinn, are you ready to rock this man? Oh yeah, Chris. How are you? I am phenomenal, brother. I am phenomenal. Thank you so much for coming on today. Dude, we love your background, man. We love that that freaking Marvel and and you know, I don't I don't know. Like I don't know which universe it is, but Marvel DC, whatever, it's it's awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome, man. You're welcome. So how are you doing today, brother? Very good, Chris. Very good. good. I love your energy like always. It's fantastic. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule. I know you're building these these Amazon businesses, you know, global shipping, kicking butt, taking names, and thank you for taking time to share with our audience. So let's dive right into the juice, man. And the juice starts off with this theme of the day, which is what would it be like if? So Quinn, how does this concept and this philosophy of, of like possibility, this what would it be like if? How does that show up in your life and what difference has it made for you? Well, I I actually often think that, I guess, mm. everybody. Would it be if uh, everything? I'm always thinking that. Mm. And I that's actually what gets me going. Because <laughs> my imagination is always going like, what? who, who can I be? What yeah. can I achieve and what mm. can I do? And yeah, I live around that. Always, you know, always trying to think. I'm always thinking like crazy <laughs> millennial entrepreneur mindset. Although I'm, I'm not a millennial, but I have the same mentality. 
<laughs> I love it. Well, I mean, you've been doing you've been doing online sales for a long freaking time, man. So it's like you had to be some kind of innovator to be able to do that. You know, for the last 21 years, like starting in the 90s, doing online sales when people didn't even know like there was an internet around, you know, like so tell us about that that journey. How did you and and you can fill us in as well on what you're doing today, the podcast, but I do want to dive back into that journey as well. So give us an overview of what you're doing today and then we'll dive back. All right. So today the main focus is Amazon since, you know, Amazon has a distribution worldwide and it's just so easy uh, launching any product with Amazon and Mm. they'll just pretty much sell it for you. Although there's a lot of things we got to do, right? But Amazon is the number one distribution platform that I have now. Mm. And when originally started, it was eBay, but uh, although I have my own distribution and Shopify stores and stuff, but mm-hmm. like I said, number one is definitely Amazon, uh, Amazon.com, which is mm-hmm. the U.S. Uh, then would be my second is Canada, although Amazon's second platform is not is not Canada. You know, it's mm-hmm. uh, U.K., Germany are, are really big and, and wow. growing fast. Mm-hmm. And Japan is pretty good as well. Wow. Yeah. So are you are you involved in all those as well? Yes, yes, I am. Uh, not not on a bigger scale as the U.S. Just because it's so so much easier uh, mm. to deal with the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. So yeah, I'm sure you've been learning lots of lessons for the past two decades. Let's go back, man. Let's go take a look at what what it, what. How did you start, and what was that journey like, learning, man? So. When I started, uh, at the time, I didn't think of it as being entrepreneurial. Hmm. I just thought of it as uh, a cool idea to to make an extra cash for my parting. Mm -hmm. I I was living in Europe, and pretty much that's all I could think of at that time was party. And what, what, what country in Europe? In Portugal. Wow. So... I was working at the time for uh, Daimler uh, Chrysler, Mm -hmm. and I still smoked, and uh, I did for 20 years after that, but uh, I gave it up now almost five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I used to go outside for a smoke, and I would walk in front of all these displays from other stores, Mm -hmm. and there's this store that had wooden hand-carved statues. Hmm. It, it looked really cool. It was, a, it was like a black wood, all hand carved and it was spectacular. Huh. And although they were too expensive for me at the time, I figured these things could probably sell for a lot more somewhere else where hmm. somebody has more money for this. Hmm. And it was uh, 97. And I didn't have, uh, of course, a smartphone. <laughs> so I, I thought of, you know, what if, there you go the what if mentality Mm, yeah what if i could take pictures of this Mm. post the pictures online and sell these products at a higher price and then when somebody buys them from me Mm -hmm. i come back to the store i'll buy it and then just ship it right nowadays there's a name for that it's called drop shipping Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and everybody knows about it but in 97 I don't think many people knew about it. I don't know if it had a name back then. <laughs> I I named it something myself, and it's kind of ridiculous, but I named it Selling the Picture. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't own the product. Right. I would literally take a camera, and it had to be a normal camera, the no, no cell phone. Uh-huh. I would take it to work, go over to the store, take pictures of each statue, and then list them on eBay USA because... Uh-huh. Portugal didn't have eBay. Mm. So Spain did after a few years, Spain, Italy, and France. But uh, the U.S., I figured the U.S. is where it, um, back then Europe didn't even have euros. It was mm-hmm. uh, each country had different currency. Wow. So I would sell in the U.S., and I figured U.S. dollars would be more valuable and I could get more money. Mm-hmm. So I kind of invented my own drop shipping by taking pictures and that, that actually gave me a lot of trouble and yeah. problems came because each product was hand carved. They were mm. one of a kind, each one. So if somebody, let's say somebody in Cincinnati <laughs> bought one of my products, 
and I would go to the store the next day to buy it. If it wasn't there, I didn't have anything to sell. Oh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it happened several times. So, um, of course, with eBay, it's easy. Uh, they, they wouldn't put any strike against you at a time like Amazon does. I would right. just go uh, refund the money and, no. you know, get a risk, a bad review. Right. But that happened often, right? And I couldn't scale that way. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's crazy. So I had a question in the audience from Prashant and he asked, what was your hottest selling item? <laughs> well, uh, back back in that time, it was um, it never got too hot because mm. there was only one of each. Right. They were all, <laughs> they were all completely different. And, you know, um, another issue I had was if... Um, I would make up kind of my shipping price. Mm -hmm. uh, eBay was not connected to PayPal. They didn't, they didn't own PayPal at the time. Uh, to be honest, I don't even know if PayPal existed yet or if they come later. Hmm. But uh, the software nowadays can tell you each package, uh, if you tell it what size it is and how much it weighs, yep. how much it's going to cost you to ship. Yep. Back then it didn't. I would go physically walk, I, I not really walk, but I would go to the post office. Mm -hmm. And when I got to the post office, then they would tell me, this is going to cost you so much. Wow. And it wasn't always a profit, right? If, <laughs> if I was lucky for the product to be there, uh, it, it, was, it wasn't always profitable, uh, uh, at least not, not lots. Some of them were, yeah. Mm. But yeah, no, there wasn't really a bestseller back then because... Um, each one was unique, so I, w I could only sell it once, and then. But those statues, they were called, um, well, they were just blackwood statues, hmm. and they they were good sellers, but one at a time. <laughs> yeah. So from the blackwood statues, what was next? Well, after that, I started actually going through things that I had at at home, hmm. things that had been given to me, stuff that my parents bought. Hmm. Uh, even things that uh, I didn't own, like my sister's stuff, whatever Love. I could get, right? I just wanted to, yeah, it could get addicting, actually. Mm. When you sell something online and you're just, at the time, I, it was just, I had a picture of something. <laughs> and I would get money <laughs> and then use part of that money to go buy something. And, you know, I was just making money from stuff that I didn't own. And right. it, it, it's still possible to do that with drop shipping, just... Nowadays, with software, you can do it in bigger, bigger scale, right? You right. can do thousands of products per right. hour, right? But uh, <laughs> wow, that's incredible, man! So you you started doing stuff you didn't own, and then what would you say was like the next phase of evolution with drop shipping for you? So one day I wanted a, uh, you know, those little fifty cc or thirty cc pocket bikes they're like uh -huh. a crotch rocket yep. but they're, they're tiny yep. i wanted one for myself mm -hmm. although um i'm six foot one and <laughs> <laughs> i still wanted one because i knew a lot of uh, people that had them and they would actually do funny races and stuff so mm -hmm. i wanted one for myself and so i went online and i find um the product always in china so mm -hmm. i could get it Mm -hmm. at, a, at a discount and I found these pocket bikes and they were selling um, it was a, it, it would have had a MOQ which is the minimum order quantity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and at the time I wasn't too too into this from China but you had a quantity of six minimum mm -hmm. and it was still a really good price to buy six compared to buying one mm -hmm. over where I was and I decided Maybe I can buy these six. I keep whatever I want and then sell the rest. And when I contacted this um, manufacturer, I guess, uh, he offered a deal. If I double the order, you would actually reduce the price a lot. Mm. So I got a, uh, um, 12 of them, a dozen. Wow. And when, these, when I received these, it was part of, part of a Seacan. When I received these, I sold them all without go going online, just through friends and stuff. Mm -hmm. I sold 10 of them in one day. Wow. All 10 of them. And I kept two of them. 
One was like a, a dirt bike, a mini dirt bike, and the other one was a mini crotch rocket. Mm -hmm. And I figured, you know what? If I can do this and one day sell everything I got, I maybe I can next time double this order, double that that one. Uh, and I wasn't even selling online, so my my geographical area was very limited. Hmm. And still, I found people that wanted more. Oh. Uh, so I started doing that then for any product that I could think of. And at the time, I, I wasn't using uh, many software tools that would tell me what was something that had huge demand, mm -hmm. which nowadays I only sell things that the demand is already there. Right. And not something that I like or something that I care for, something yeah. that has the demand already. Right. But back then, I was kind of guessing at demand. Hmm. And after the pocket bikes, I got into cell phone cases, which back in uh, maybe 2007, 2008, uh, cell phone cases was right at the beginning. Uh, maybe, what was it called? Uh, iPhone 4 or 5? Is it 3? Wow. Maybe 3? Wow. Well, yeah. And that's when, yeah, cell phone cases started becoming something really hot, and I was... I was there already, so that was really good. <laughs> wow! And would you say that's where your your like growth, kind of the big a big phase of growth was for you? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. That was a uh, big growth, and d there were so many failures too. Right, I fell so often that uh, luckily I ha I developed a huge passion for this, mm. so I never gave up. Every time one of those failures would show up. And I would buy a bunch of stock that would never sell and just mm. keep it somewhere in, uh, in the shed or the garage. Um, but the passion made me keep on going, keep on going. And eventually, mm. each failure would teach me something. Uh, and I would just get better at it. And, uh, of course, uh, still not perfect. Mm. I still fail. But it's uh, I actually now enjoy failing because mm. uh, I do it really early. And I don't, so I can cap, you know, don't let a failure grow and just go from there. Right, right. Um, you're wise. You're wise about how to how to get the most testing <laughs> with the least <laughs> amount of dollars. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, man. Awesome. Um, during that time, how was it with your family? How did you, you know, was it challenging financially? Did you have to, you know, like like struggle was it you know you were pretty well off for the most part or how did it go no it, there was lots of struggles and at the same time uh, let's say from 2007 on mm -hmm. um i came back to canada and i was working in the oil and gas industry hmm. so i i had a full-time job at that time and it was at least, you know, some 12, sometimes 14 hours a day with travel. Wow. And this is working in an uh, oil sand site. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not that there was super, super demanding physically, but there was a lot of time uh, that I had, I couldn't put on my own mm -hmm. and I was working for somebody else. But because in the oil industry, the money is so good. I, mm. I kind of developed that passion for the money, not for what I was doing. Mm. And uh, I kind of lost where I was going with this. But, <laughs> but uh, oh, yes, the family the and family, all yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, uh, I kind of, to release a little bit of stress, I started doing some, some gaming with... Uh, you know, uh, PC games and mm -hmm. some real life economy games and, and where you can buy land and buy apartments and sell it and, and then mm. actually cash it out for real money. Wow. And instead of developing my own online world at that point, I started spending a lot of time on the computer, but I was kind of just fooling myself and fooling the ex at the time because I was just getting lost into those games. Right. And then after a while, uh, me and the ex ended up uh, splitting up and kind of now, now family life is wonderful. It's yeah. really good. Actually, next door, I have my twins. Uh, that are, um, two days ago, they turned one year old. 
Wow. Both of them, of course. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And then I have a four-year-old that's going to be five next month. And life is beautiful with them and my uh, current wife, which uh, stands behind me in everything I do. And now mm. this is all I do. So full time uh, between the two podcasts and launching products and Shopify yeah. stores, Amazon. Uh, yes, it's not that uh, before... Uh, the the ex wasn't supportive. She was. Mm -hmm. It's just that I I wasn't. I got lost for a bit. Right. And financially, it wasn't. You know, it wasn't never bad because uh, even with just working on the oil sands, uh, to start off, uh, you start always with a six figure salary mm -hmm. just on from from day one. Wow. And free vehicles. They'll, they'll give you a pickup. To use uh, hmm. all the time, uh, free gas, everything. So it was it was not hard, uh, but it, it could have been better if I had dedicated myself to to my own passion and, and dreams that I forgot for a while. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful man. So you you grew in your career. You started learning more. You started getting more success. And then what? How did you start the podcast? Because I know you mentioned that that's like really just to show up and serve, right? Yes. So yeah. the podcast, uh, the one of them is the QA selling online, and the QA is questions and answers, and at the mm. same time is Queen of Warm. Mm. So I kind of at the time it wasn't on purpose, but then I decided to use it both ways. <laughs> but you know, when I started selling and, and I started to see a little bit of uh, more success with Amazon, I started slowing down my eBay uh, business. And kind of Shopify, since I already have the store set up, some organic traffic coming, I started kind of focusing more uh, on Amazon. Hmm. Never putting all eggs on that basket, but the majority of them, at least, you know, probably 90% focus right. on Amazon. And I, I, I joined a lot of Amazon groups and I love learning myself. And I started listening to podcasts and and I, I started getting asked lots of questions through Amazon and through uh, friends, family, people that wanted to, to start as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I found a lot of those questions were the same. Uh, a lot of people would ask the same ones over and over. Things that to me were just so, so simple mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, I've done it for so long, it becomes kind of like my default. And I realized instead of answering um, I actually learned this on, on on a previous podcast. Instead of answering everybody, and this was about customer support, instead of answering the same question over and over and over, record it, hmm. and then you, you can. Um, and this was, I just used this from somebody else that taught me how to deal with VAs. Mm -hmm. So you get questions often asked about products over and over. Yep. Write it down, give it to your VA, VA so they can reply with mm. your template yeah and i just took that a little bit overboard and i created a podcast and i started answering everything on the podcast uh -huh. and it got to a point where i kind of run out of questions at first uh the audience was very limited at the beginning and i did run out of questions so i kind of just start you know giving out some tips and i was doing it five days a week so uh every weekday i would take uh saturday sunday off mm -hmm. And it's uh, up to close 200 episodes now, and now wow. the audience is in the thousands weekly, so it's really good. Good job. And yeah, like I said, that one is just content. I, I actually, I don't even accept advertising on the podcast. Hmm. I've, I've been offered, and I turned down a five-figure offer for advertising, which, you know, it, it did hurt because... Uh, although I want to offer content, I still enjoy money. I guess. <laughs> but I tell the audience, you know, this is, I don't want anybody to think that this podcast is for um, try to sell something in the future. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a course or anything to sell. I give them the content, no advertising. Mm -hmm. And then my other one, which is the fell fast podcast about failures and how to pass the failures and keep on going hmm. and that one eventually uh, i will have uh, ads uh, but yeah. the other awesome. one is just 
you know, just to, to give. What did it take for you to get the, um, you said you're at 200 episodes with the uh, QA selling. What did it take to get to, you know, thousands of, of listeners per week and, and high traffic? Uh, it was, it worried me for the longest time because it took several months. Hmm. Uh, I, after I launched, I was getting um, probably, well, I started by 60. I remember getting 60 downloads and I was super excited when I had like two, three episodes. And then uh, months in, probably after six months, I started to see uh, a, a really exponential growth. Hmm. And I, I think it's two two factors. One is the fact that the number of episode, episodes would grow at five per week. Right. And even if they were just getting the same amount of downloads, I was getting now that multiplied by 50 episodes, 60 episodes. Mm. And now I'm at um, 100, and, I believe 180 or so. Mm. And I see thousands, but it, it for the first six, seven months, it was, it was nothing really, uh, really big. And mm. it started to triple at that time. Wow. And that's when I started to notice a really big growth was after probably month seven, uh, 3Xing, 3Xing. And wow. it, it do, was. Do you know what, like, what, what do you attribute that growth to? Well, I think it was just maybe the uh, iTunes algorithms, uh, you know, index me a bit higher or, or in the search. Maybe the number of episodes. Uh, now multiplied by the same number of downloads also mm. increased the weekly stats right because instead of having just 10 episodes downloading i have now 180 mm -hmm. and i guess both those factors i'm just guessing that uh, itunes algorithm and google play they also want to favor uh you know podcasts that, that are going to stick around mm. there's a lot of people that start one and two weeks in they give it up Mm -hmm. So you can see there's a lot of podcasts that you can search and they have four episodes and they're a, a year old, mm -hmm. right? So it was, it was given up. It's still sitting there, but I guess they probably get less traction when, when you're more active. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing you, you get a little bit more help. Plus my content is great, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Do you do any kind of like promotion to, to get it out there? Do you share it in like Facebook groups? Do you use a mailing list? What's the, the strategy to get, get it out there? So I do uh, mostly organic mm -hmm. um, through, um, through Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, and the groups, I share it when somebody asks. But... Um, I don't want to f f sound or look spammy right. by just going to the group and here, here's my link. Right. So when I'm asked or uh, Twitter, I also shared on Twitter, which is a really good platform hmm. where um, the, um, a couple of the biggest podcast hosts uh, weekly allow you to share your podcast. And then when I do, they retweet it. Hmm. And so uh, Lipson and Blueberry, they do that as well. Hmm. So, and then uh, on, on LinkedIn, I have um, well, probably close to 15,000 followers on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and I don't know, about 12, 13,000 connections there. So it, it's a really good tool on LinkedIn when I share something and somebody else shares that and their audience mm -hmm. sees it. Yeah. So, and nice. I promote some by the boost, you know, the Facebook boost from the mm -hmm. page. Mm hmm. I know it's not the best marketing tool, but since I just want more eyes on my uh, uh, on my link, I do you know weekly uh, or weekly per episode like six twelve dollar boost, which can bring me another uh, twenty seven hundred eyes to to the podcast. Right. Awesome. Or, ear, awesome or ears in this case right 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 that's that's incredible um and in terms of like building a brand like what what would you say are some of the fundamental important things of building a online brand so one of the main things that i find is uh consistency mm -hmm. and quality mm -hmm. and and customer service 
yeah. customer service I know is super important. That's probably one of the reasons why Amazon is number one is because their service is great, right? They have the instant gratification by delivering your product the same day or the next day. Um, yeah. And at the same time, if you have any issue with a product, you know 100% that you will get a refund or you will get a new product, right? Right. So even if the, it's a third party seller that's not willing to deal with you, Amazon will refund you and they will take care of you. Right. So I, I know uh, following, copying what they do, I know customer service is super important. So I'm on it uh, like that. And I also have a VA that helps. Hmm. And so it's super, um, we do less than eight hour answer to any customer uh, wow. question or anything. If, if there's issues with a problem, uh, with a problem, with a product, mm -hmm. and it happens sometimes, right? Uh, if a product doesn't work or if it was I got there broken I don't try to blame the shipping company that broke it or nothing hmm. I see I try to minimize my loss I see if it, if it's worth it um, to if the product is too expensive I may ask them to, sh to ship it back right. if not I don't even worry I, I'll just tell them you know what if it's broken if you can keep it uh, use it use it I'm gonna send you a new one anyway yeah and I rather send a new one than refund because um, it costs me less to send a new one, right? Right. right. Uh, I I buy it at less, and I, I have no issue. As soon as the, pro, uh, the the client says they have an issue with the any product, I'll just uh, let them know that a new one is on the way. Hmm. Keep that one as well if you want. Throw it away, and and just hope that they don't want to return because Amazon tracks also uh, the amount of returns that you get. And that's how they see if the quality of your product is good or not. Hmm. And which brings me to the, my other one, which is the quality of the product. I try to have the best. I source from China, just like anybody else in the world. I can get, I buy my products from China, but China can make a super cheap product like we know, but mm -hmm. they can also make, iPhones, right? They mm. can make Nike shoes, anything that you want with quality. If you're willing to pay for that quality, they will make it. Right. So, and it's unfortunately a lot of uh, business people that have the only profit mentality, mm. they will source the lowest cost possible. And then of course those products, uh, cheap products are exactly that. They're cheap products. Yeah. So yeah, and then I try to be consistent uh, with with my branding, and try to create a story when when it's a brand, mm -hmm. because I also have another brand which I call the Everything Brand, mm -hmm. and it's a a account because you if you have permission from Amazon you can have more than one account, mm -hmm. right? So if you create let's say if you're in the states if you create a second LLC you can have a second account for that LLC with a second bank account connected to it. Mm -hmm. And they'll allow you that as long as kind of the products are not really competing. Mm -hmm. So you don't take the monopoly of the first page. Right. But I have one brand that I use for testing. Mm -hmm. And I don't really create a brand. I don't brand the products. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the let's see if this flies. Mm -hmm. And instead of ordering uh, I don't know, a C can of uh, Bluetooth speakers, mm -hmm. I'm going to get a, a sample of 50 or 100 without any branding, without special packaging. And and I can really test the market that way. Mm. And, you know, if they fly off the shelf on day one, now I s send it over to my brand account. I create nice packaging. I brand it. And then I, I then I follow that consistency for that brand. But until then, until it proves itself, it's just part of my everything brand. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. still quality, but you know, no, no branding, no extra costs. Designer. How do you how do you know what what is quality or not? Like, do you have to go to China? Do you have stuff shipped to, shipped to you to test it and see if it's quality first? How does that work? Yeah. So there's. Um, three ways to do it 
one is you always get a sample. Mm. Uh, I always get a sample uh, to test the quality myself. Uh, but because I know that when I request a sample, they're going to send me the best thing they have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So sometimes if the sample has no quality, I know right away, yeah. this is not, that's the best one you can find to give me. So that's not going to fly. Right. Now, if the sample has quality, there's still two other things. Uh, a lot of people go to China and there's a lot of fairs we can go and you know meet the sellers meet the manufacturers actually visit the do tours there and check the quality there it still doesn't guarantee that the product is going to be shipped to you is the quality that you saw there hmm. so my, uh, stage three is you get an inspection there's uh, companies in china that you can hire to do inspections for you so uh, when you order a product, uh, you pay 30% up front. Mm -hmm. After the product is finished, before it gets shipped, I'll send my uh, inspection company mm. and they can do a 25, 30 page report on, on these products. And they can open one in every four, open the package, uh, check the product, test the product, use it. Mm. If a certain percentage of it um, doesn't, um, doesn't pass the test, mm -hmm. then they'll open more, right? Mm -hmm. They'll open one in every two. And just to see, uh, and this is before I pay the remaining 70%. Right. And um, yeah, so at this point, uh, if, if it doesn't pass, there's two options. Uh, they redo the whole thing. They have to rebuild everything if the manufacturer wouldn't be willing that didn't happen to me yet mm -hmm. if for some reason they weren't willing uh i'd rather lose my 30 percent than continue with that manufacturer right. Right. and it, it still it d doesn't mean it's 100 percent defective uh defect pr uh, f uh proof mm -hmm. but it, it helps a lot because they will open one and four and when the your manufacturer knows that uh, they don't want to, they'll lose money too. So yeah. they're going to give me the quality that I asked for. Right. And I, I try not to, there's a lot of people that uh, teach that when you're dealing with Chinese factories, you should negotiate and save every single penny uh, that you can. Mm -hmm. And the reality is when they give you a price for a product and they say, I don't know, that Bluetooth speaker is going to cost you $6. I know that's not the final price. Mm -hmm. So the final price now could be four and a half dollars per per unit, depending on what quantity you're going to order, right? Mm -hmm. So I first negotiate down to that point, then I tell them what quantity I'm going to go for, and at that point I can negotiate a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But if you try to go now, I want this product for three dollars. Sometimes they're they're willing to go down to that price, but something's going to have to pay for that and it's going to be the quality mm. because they can cut corners to save you money and that's where uh, the bad rep for Chinese products comes is because they can shave those corners and they will because they want you as a customer they're going to give you you're going to get what you paid for right how do you how do you know what the like what the tolerance is, how do you know how much to negotiate down and no further? <laughs> well, you're never a hundred percent sure, but there's some ways to do it. So mm -hmm. one is, uh, you can use Google translator mm -hmm. and translate the words for, or if you have a VA that speaks Chinese, you can do the same thing, just get them to do it. Mm -hmm. And you can go to uh, other sites where, where they sell, that company will sell in China as well. So you can go see what they charge for it in their own market. Mm. Because when they're selling in China, this, let's say this Bluetooth speaker, mm. they're not going to sell it for 1999, right? right? Because right. Uh, their market won't be able to afford those 1999. Right. So in that case, if I see uh, that they are selling for other all wholesalers in China for, four dollars mm -hmm. okay now i know that 
up until then, up until those four dollars, I'm probably safe to do so. So I can use Google Translate and then do a search with Chinese characters and find that same company selling on the wow. Chinese market. Wow. Wow, that's incredible. So, you know, if, if they're would do you think they would cut corners to sell into their own market? Um I guess it is possible. It's possible, right? Yeah. It, it is possible, yeah, because, you know, uh, the chances of somebody buying the most expensive one in the Chinese market probably are, are less. Well, yeah. But at the same time, um, there's something that I really like about them is that they enjoy relationships and mm. building relationships. Mm. So when when you're dealing with somebody more than once, and we talk through Skype and WhatsApp yeah. and um, sometimes daily. And you get to know these people's uh, family mm. and, you know, they uh, often create a North American name. So mm -hmm. it's easier for us to deal with them. Yeah. And, and then they always treat you by dear, even if, you know, even if you're a man, they always call you dear, they're dear Quinn. Mm. And when you build these relationships, they will stay on, they'll, you know, they're on your side. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, we're, we're friends and, um, I, I've learned to trust some of them like that. And they actually, uh, send me during Christmas. Now they send me gifts. Oh. Uh, and you know, if a new product has, um, piqued a lot of sellers interests, mm. they will contact me and say, by the way, have a look at this new product that we have that's, you know, I don't know, the new fidget spinner mm -hmm. is crazy. And mm -hmm. right, I never sold fidget spinners. <laughs> 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 but yeah, relationships are very important. And yeah. when you build them, you, you will be able to trust them yeah. at that point. Yeah, yeah that's powerful. I, I, love, I love that, you know, the business, the global business. I think there's a lot of online entrepreneurs who, who it's like, Working with people in a different language, you know, in different language and different cultures um, can be very interesting and, and eye opening about like what we think it's supposed to be like. But also there can be many advantages and, and rewards to doing that like you, you're experiencing, man. That's awesome. Yeah, it's very, very cool knowing, uh, not knowing at first mm. when you start talking to somebody which has they have the language barrier and mm. some of them have really, really good English. Mm. But when you're talking to somebody that has an English so good, uh, like, for example, one of my, um, I guess he's just a, a seller on, on that uh, company. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, his name is Michael. And I guess that's his North American name. And if you're talking to him, there's no clue that he is not uh, North American. There is no accent, nothing. Wow. But because he learned it in school, uh, certain words that we use kind of more slang, they could not understand and misinterpret it. Hmm. So I learned that sometimes when you say that, um, make sure that the base is blue, hmm. the base may not be the base. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I'll now I'll follow up with an image and an arrow pointing this blue, hmm. right? And, and then again, another thing which uh, to us, um, to me, for example, uh, there used to be blue is blue, but now there's like 37 different blues. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to know that uh, the package is going to match the, the product itself and the blue is the same blue. Yeah. So it's just not, it has to be also visual along with the communication so we can skip that that language barrier wow man that's awesome so you have all this experience you know selling stuff online how do you see this impacting you over the coming years like what do you what do you see as the vision for yourself your your family your business what are what are some real big aspirations that you're moving towards you know i I want um, me and my wife. She wants to be more part of it and help as well. It's awesome. Right now, it's a little bit hard because uh, we have 
two one-year-old twins, uh, and it is it's and a, a, and a four-year-old. <laughs> yes. The four-year-old is very helpful. Awesome. The twins, it's a blessing, and at the same time, oh man, my little boy is so lovely, but it's like he swallowed a, a siren. He's so loud. <laughs> He's so, so crazy. Uh, and he doesn't even walk, but he rides an electric quad and he mm. can't even walk yet. And he runs over everything, runs over his sister with the quad. <laughs> anyway, it's crazy. <laughs> so mom doesn't have much time to dedicate to to help. So it's, you know, between uh, naps and breaks and stuff. Mm. But our plan is kind of being able to allow me to disconnect a little bit more and have uh, maybe VAs and um, get somebody else probably to, to help run it when I'm not around. Hmm. Because right now I'm, uh, I still like, I enjoy it. For hmm. one, I really enjoy what I do. Yeah. And that's why I do it all day, all the time. And I, I could be at it constantly. But the thing is, if an issue happens, I have to be on it and I have to be, I have to fix it. If mm -hmm. something gets stuck at customs or, you know, uh, I'm going to deal with it. And I want to be able to not be needed if I want to go out and, you know, uh, s go over to Europe again, because I haven't been there in four years now. Mm. So th that's kind of the plan have um allison uh be able to help out a bit more now uh, the kids uh, one of them is going to school soon wow. and then with the help of vas i have one va that's so like so amazing <laughs> uh she's been doing this for so long and she has worked with some of the top e-commerce experts mm -hmm. in the world mm -hmm. and just because that's what she does and she's became so good at it, doing it for so long. Um, several people try to hire her and I found her through Upwork. Mm. And, you know, uh, not only she saves me a ton of money by doing the things that normally would take uh, 30 hours to do, she can do it with software and stuff. She can do it in one hour. Wow. So uh, really, really great. And I just need to be able to Trust more and let go. Hmm. Hmm. Awesome, man. So you learn how to delegate. You learn how to yeah. manage. You know your your time and and bring in your wife to be able to help you guys. I'm sure like some some uh, you know like nanny nanny help would be able to you know that would make a difference for you too to help with the kids and give you more rest and stuff like that. But I'm sure that's that's all coming with time and you know like as as things grow. It's awesome, man. It's awesome, Quinn. What, what would you say is most fulfilling for you about being able to sell things online? Well, I'll, I'm going to tell you uh, a couple. Yeah. One is uh, when, without expecting, walking into somebody's home. Mm. And I know right now the products that I have are private label, mm -hmm. meaning um, if I sell a... A, let's stick with the Bluetooth speaker. If I sell a Bluetooth speaker, I'm the only person in the world selling that brand. Mm. Right? Yeah. So if I walk into somebody's home and I see something that I created mm. and with my brand sitting on their shelf, wow. it's like, oh my. So like, it's at first it's like, what a coincidence. And then I'm like, well, there's people everywhere buying my stuff it's wow. i have things inside people's homes that they are using and it's making them happy and they're wow. right it's doing their job so that's one hmm. and another one is uh, you know my four-year-old uh, the other day uh, i was podcasting and she often walks in here and she says daddy can i podcast too and she asks to podcast. Sometimes I, you know, I record. I let her record. And one of these days, I asked her so uh, about what do you want to do. And she said, "Well, 
I want to sell things online. Hmm. I'm like, okay, I, I know where you heard this before, right? <laughs> they listen. And then when I asked her what she was going to sell is she was going to use Facebook Messenger bots to sell uh, food online to people that didn't have money to buy food. Wow. So basically, her plan was uh, there was no money involved. She was going to uh, give food to people that couldn't afford food, and she was going to sell it online using Facebook Messenger bots. Oh, wow. Like, <laughs> wow. So it's, wow. yeah, so I know she is listening. So uh, that's why I, you always got to be careful um, what you're saying because there's always little ears listening. And she already has a positive mind. She wants to do something nice for somebody. So that's, that's, that's very fulfilling. Yeah, man. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. And, and it's, you know, people could be uh, focused on just the making money, right? But you're focused on giving back. Your, your show is just like pure testament to that. And then you can see it in your, in your lineage and your kids are like, I want to give back too. So that's, that's amazing, man. Your heart is like truly showing up and, and really incredible, incredible. So we're beginning to wrap up Quinn and we'll, we want to know the biggest lessons again for, for you in your entrepreneurial journey or building a brand, um, just wrapping this thing up and, and sharing what, what's, what are your biggest takeaways in your, in your journey? Number one, biggest one is it's actually a little pet peeve that I have at the same time. A lesson that I learned is uh, that you always need to know that there's a ton of things that you don't know. Mm hmm. So you got to constantly learn, even if you think you already know everything. Mm -hmm. And there was a point in my life when I was a bit more immature, maybe. And I thought I thought I knew everything. Mm -hmm. And I just learned that the less I think I know, the more teachable I am and the more I will actually learn and better I'll become. Wow. And one of the things I noticed was a lot of people start online businesses or any kind of business and with maybe uh, I was going to say the wrong intention uh, but it's not really the wrong intention it's just that maybe they don't they don't go deep enough in the reasons why they're starting it right mm. and a lot of people think that I started this business because I'm going to I want to make money but the real reason is not making the money is what you want that money for. Right. And then because if you're chasing the money, it's never going to be enough. The more you get, the more you're going to, uh, the more product you're going to have out in somebody else's warehouse. So the more money you make, more money is going to be out there. More time you're going to be in front of a computer doing something. Or if it's a physical business, you're going to be in that business. When in reality, if your goal was to make enough money, so you could have freedom to spend your more time with your family. Hmm. You're actually missing the point now because you're not spending time with your family. And now you got a ton of money, hmm. but your family never sees you. Right. So uh, I just wanted people to think, go past the money point. Why hmm. do you want that money? Hmm. And, you know, I want the money because I want to drive a Lamborghini. Okay. Now, why do you want that Lamborghini is because, you want to drive fast or you want to be able to, I don't know, you want to become this internet guru that needs a Lamborghini for every picture, right? <laughs> is, is that the reason, right? It's, and just go deeper on in the reason why you want to start this hmm. and so you don't miss it when, you re, when you're when you able to reach it. Yeah, and, that, that and it's like beginning with the end in mind, you know, like begin with, with the lifestyle that you want to create. A lot of people say, Oh, well, I'll be able to create my lifestyle one day. It's like, no, start with engineering your life for, you know, putting in the, the time of fun, putting in the time of meditation, putting in the time with family, putting in the time of whatever, rest, relaxation, design that first, and then, you know, put the things around it, put the business building around it. Absolutely. And, and write down your goals yes. so, so you know where you're going to. So, yes. so you actually have something which is, Find your GPS. Is it a uh, where's your GPS? Yeah, yeah, be your GPS. Be your GPS. <laughs> uh, that's 
really good because yeah. it's write your goals down so you it's like your GPS is taking you where you need to go or else yeah. you're lost. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. I love it. Every day, getting clear on those those goals, have the habits, have the disciplines, rituals, 100%. So, Quinn, how do, the, how do these people stay connected with you? They, they love what you're talking about. They want to learn, learn more. How do they stay connected? Uh, well, there's uh, two podcasts. is uh, QA Selling Online, and it's, I actually have the website QASellingOnline.com. Mm-hmm. And the other one is really easy to find is fail fast podcast. And that's at failfastpodcast.com. Mm-hmm. You can find me there. I'm also on LinkedIn. Quinn Amorm. It's just mm-hmm. one N Q U I N. Mm-hmm. And uh, Amorm is A M O R I M. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, always at the same name, Quinn Amorm. And uh, that's it. Twitter as well, at Quinn Amor. Dude, you're the man. I'm excited to see you grow, and this is just the beginning, man, of your success of really creating an amazing legacy for yourself, for your family, and just in the world, man. Thank you for having your products show up in people's homes and uh, really touching people in in a deep, meaningful way. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, buddy. Absolutely, brother. Well, you have the best week ever, and we'll see you soon, okay? You too. Thank you. Take care.